view that one should never make utterances that fail their test. They just meant that one had not, on their view, made, on their definition, made an assertion, a true false claim. One's utterance lacked assertoric meaning. Now, it was nearly near universally agreed by them that much, if not indeed most, of the language of ethics, of art criticism, of religion, fails the positivist test of assertoric meaning. We do not, they thought, use sentences in those domains to make true false claims. And that's why the rush was on to identify the sort of meaning that utterances in these areas do have. Some of the proposals that emerged were strange, such as R.M. Harris' suggestion that when a religious person uses God talk, she is, she is expressing what Hare called a blick. And some suggestions that emerged in ethics, at least, were truly silly, such as the suggestion that when I say, it was wrong of you to deceive her the way you did, what I am really doing is booing your deception. You deceived her, boo to you. <laughs> the 18th century Scots philosopher Thomas Reed with his incomparable talent and penchant for mordant wit, would have had a field day had he had such material to work on. But all he had was Hume. <laughs> I mentioned that though logical positivism was its, in its heydays in the 50s, its death was in fact imminent. Never, to the best of my knowledge, knowledge has a philosophical movement collapsed so suddenly and totally. Collapsed within philosophy, that is. To this day, one sometimes hears intellectuals and academics outside philosophy announcing as the obvious truth of the matter positions which in their essentials are the same as those of the logical positivists. I suppose this is partly due to the lingering influence of positivism, but I think it's partly due to the fact that the positivists were articulating a line of thought that lies deep in the mentality of modernity. Be that those speculations as they may, within philosophy collapse, it did. Some 15 years ago, I assigned my students at Yale to read parts of Ayer's language, truth and logic as preparation for discussing Wittgenstein's philosophy of religion. This may in fact have been when you were a TA. They disliked it intensely. They found it impossible to take Ayer's views seriously. They talked about his views as one would talk, oh, I don't know, about some musty item that one has discovered up in the attic. And they found Ayer's tone unbearably arrogant. So, it's a new day. Now I move from description to story. From my description of the philosophical ethos of those bygone days to my narrative of influence. Al titled his first book, published in 1967, God and Other Minds. Notice, not God talk, but God. Today, more than 40 years later, it's almost impossible to appreciate what a bold move this was. The air at the time, as I've tried to indicate, was abuzz with talk about God talk. It being widely assumed that such talk is something other than refer to and make claims about God. And then, a young philosopher steps into this buzz and announces a book about God. The book proved to be as influential as it was bold. Shortly, it was only the Wittgensteinian philosophers of religion who talked much about God talk. The others talked about God. I said that the book is not about God talk. That's true, but a little bit misleading. The book contained an acute attack on the positivist criterion for astrotoric meaning and Al drew out the implications of that attack for our understanding of religious language. So in that, to that extent, it was about language. But I think it's pretty clear that the only reason this discussion of religious language occurs in the book is that Al judged rightly that many readers would not take seriously his claim to be, his claim to be making claims about God if he didn't first dispose of the positivist reason for holding that we can't make claims about God. Now, of course, removing the positivist strictures on talk about God leaves one with Kantian strictures on judgments about God. But those strictures have never gained much purchase among analytic philosophers. They presuppose Kant's doctrine that what is given to us in awareness is in no, 
in no respect reality as it is in itself, but only reality as it appears to us, along with Kant's doctrine of experiences categorically structured by the mind. And most analytic philosophers, if they're even acquainted with those doctrines, have not found them compelling. I said that the book was about God. Not about God talk, but about God. That too is a little bit misleading. It gives the impression that the book is an essay in philosophical theology, and strictly speaking, it's not. God and Other Minds, to quote its subtitle, is a study of the rational justification of belief in God. And the main argument was a parity argument. If it's rational to believe in other human minds, then it's rational to believe in God. But surely it is rational to believe in other minds, therefore it's rational to believe in God. The book played a decisive role in changing the main topic in analytic philosophy of religion from religious language to the epistemology of religious belief. And the epistemology of religious belief has continued ever since to be a major topic within analytic philosophy of religion. Now it's easy to see why Al wanted to change the topic from religious language. Adherence to the positivist verability, verifiability criterion gave urgency to the topic of religious language, but reject that doctrine and the urgency disappears. But why change the topic to the rational justification of religious belief? Of all the topics one might discuss instead of religious language, why that one? I sometimes hear it said about Al's work that while he is a philosophical systematician par excellence, he has a tin ear for cultural trends and mindsets and for the role that philosophy can play in identifying and critiquing those. I regard this as flat out mistaken. In choosing to talk about the rational justification of theistic belief, Al was not just selecting a topic on which he anticipated being able to hone and display his talents as a systematician. He was engaging a charge against theistic belief in general and Christian belief in particular, one that runs deep in the mindset of modernity. It's the charge that it's not rational to hold such beliefs. Once one has disposed of the positivist charge that God talk is assertorically meaningless, one is face to face with that much older and more enduring charge that it's not rational to hold beliefs about God. And responding to that charge has proved to be one of the main themes in Al's work as a whole. I'm inclined to think it's probably the main theme. God and Other Minds was his first go at it. Let me say something here about the term rational. After God and Other Minds, Al was increasingly shied away from using the term rational in that broad catch-all sense in which he used it there. And I think his reasons for shying away from using the term in that broad sense when developing his own epistemology are very good reasons. I share them. But from God and other minds forward, Al has dealt with one and another form of the charge that there's something, that there's something defective about theistic belief. And that charge is typically put by saying that it's not rational to hold theistic beliefs. One of my Yale colleagues about five years ago once remarked in a discussion that religious believer, believers suffer from what she called a rationality deficit. Um, and she meant this as a broad brush charge. So we need the term if we are to identify the charge. Whereas God and other minds changed the main topic in philosophy of religion from religious language to religious epistemology, L's 1983 essay, Reason and Belief in God, along with a few essays on the topic that preceded it, changed the field of epistemology as a whole. Let me briefly rehearse how that went. In God and Other Minds, Al had plunged ahead to defend the rational justifiedness of belief in God. In the essay, Reason and Belief in God, he took a step back and asked why it is so often said that beliefs about God are not rationally justified. No one says that about perceptual beliefs, about memory beliefs, about beliefs concerning other minds, and so forth, or maybe a few skeptics here and there. 
And the answer L proposed to that question 